Jake here with the Motivational Predator. I'm here with a message for everybody that's about to give up. Don't do it. Face your life. We lost more than just, you know, two incredible family members, right? Yeah, there was a lot of, yeah, knowledge that they carried with them. You weren't born in this world to die. You were not born to live a few minutes and finally realize that you were a live person. Jake Sampson ended up coaching me and my brother and a group of other people in Bonneville uh, in jiu-jitsu. You have to get up off your butts. You have to find the world and stop fearing other humans. And the next thing you knew, he had a whole club there and uh, classes for kids and adults and everything. You need to get outside. You need to do what you got to do to be successful. Jacob looked up at Tamora. It's not just like a, an uncle. Or, you know, it was just more than that. He was almost like that father figure. And find your reason to live. Find your reason to survive. They were out moose hunting. Um, they're going to provide for the family. Should have been just like any other normal hunting trip. They've lost so much. My brother's kids. The... I felt like my heart exploded. Like I knew. Now I should be getting that text from him pretty quick or a call from him pretty quick and, and it didn't come and all of a sudden like I just I felt like my heart exploded my whole world like my whole heart everything was just ripped my soul was ripped right out of me this pain is just unlike anything I've ever experienced. It's like somebody just took a knife and stabbed me right in the heart. I'll never have friends like those two. They were like my kids. March 2020, Jacob Sampson and Morris Cardinal had just finished having a successful moose hunt. They were going to feed their family, but instead they were confronted at this intersection and they were shot dead. Their bodies were not discovered until the following morning. On April 1st, 2020, an arrest is made. The next day, RCMP say Anthony Bilodeau of Glendon, Alberta is charged with two counts of second-degree murder. Both of the accused are held in remand until their trial on May 9th, 2022 in Edmonton, Alberta. They were out moose hunting, um, and then my brother Morris, they're there to, they're going to provide for the family. And uh, yeah, that's what they were doing. It was, should have been just like any other normal hunting trip. Ruby Smith is Jacob's mother and Morris's sister. We met her and her daughter, Gina Lavasser, in nearby Bonneville. March 27th, 2020 seemed like a normal hunting trip. I talked to them um, earlier in the day. Um, they were just, because I had uh, my grandson, Dalen, and I had my granddaughter, um, Addison, the, Jake's two, two children, and he left him with me. And he's just checking in, he's telling them he loved them and so forth. And then I talked to uh, Morris briefly. And then the second time I talked to them, they had got the moose and then they got some rabbits. And of course, 
Morris is like, hey, Margaret, can you get me some stuff for soup? Then, a little less than normal. When I hadn't heard back from them, hadn't heard back. And then between Sarah, Jake's wife, she'd been calling too to see if we've heard from the boys. And we didn't hear back. And I said, well, maybe they just went back to Morris's girlfriend's place or something. They'll call us tomorrow. Sarah Sampson lives in Noble Beaufort, Alberta. She remembers how the pandemic influenced decision making. First, Jake was laid off. The pandemic hit, of course, and uh, he was a contractor. Um, so he contracted to Suncor, and uh, of course, they got rid of the contractors first. Then, pandemic restrictions. We didn't know what was going to happen with the pandemic. You're hearing about Italy and all these places getting like, you know, they were shutting down and they were like having to have passes just to go to the store and stuff like that. We were like, let's get them up north and they can go hunting and then he can get back in, in case it, they shut down on everything. Their oldest child, Sierra, stayed in Nobleford with Sarah. Addison and Dalen went with them, went with him up north. On the 27th, when they went hunting, um, they stayed at Michael's house and he woke up in the morning and he was like, he was like, Addison's not going to come with me, but Dalen is. The last minute, as they were walking out the door, Dalen turned around and said, you know what, I don't want to go with you guys. He blames himself. He thinks that if he had gone with them, it would have been different. Jake kept in touch throughout the day. He would called me about 9 o'clock p.m. and he was like, okay, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave here soon. So we texted a few times and I, you know, he's like, hey, you know, I'm going to take off soon. And, and uh, I, I just kind of was like, no problem. Like, I didn't think anything of it. And I said, call me when you get home. And I just remember just sitting there on the couch and I was kind of looking at my phone saying, you know, he should be home soon. Like, you know, I should be getting that text from him pretty quick or a call from him pretty quick and, and it didn't come and all of a sudden like I just I felt like my heart exploded and it was like I knew something happened you know I called texted called texted nothing all night long I never heard from him again William Cardinal Mauer is Jake and Morris's cousin, but Morris's uncle Mo. So Morris is technically my cousin, but we just, he was all, like, we, you know, he's, he, he received uncle status very early on, yeah. Cardinal Mauer grew up in Iron River, Alberta. I grew up with a pretty, like with pretty decent privilege, you know, of um, like, being uh, being the son to like a like a well-known like, business owner in the area. At a young age, he felt like just another kid in a non-indigenous community. Um, didn't really see myself as indigenous growing up. Also, um, like my like my mom's Métis, and she grew up during a time where like she wasn't allowed to be indigenous. So um, I, I kind of grew up pretty disconnected from all of that stuff. It wasn't until like I graduated high school and moved to Edmonton that I really started like reconnecting with like my culture and his culture and traditions are very important to him now. He wonders whether his family's cultural legacy will continue. After Wolf Lake, the, after our like our settlement disbanded, um, that way of life was pretty much lost, except for um, the, my uncle Willie. My, you know, my uncle Morris and Jacob, like they were the three that really just uh, carried on those traditions. Yeah, it's pretty, um, it's pretty sad. Um, yeah, what's happened, and and you know, we lost more than just you know two incredible family members, right? Yeah, there was a lot of yeah knowledge that they carried with them, you know, that we'll never have again.
we drive out to visit Willie Cardinal, stopping at the store in Iron River for tobacco. And then, you know, with Jacob and Morris being taken from us, you know, like that, like that knowledge was lost, you know, and then Uncle Willie's really the only one left. Willie Cardinal knows the land. My parents were from here. All my uncles and aunties were from here. My ancestors were from across the lake. The lake to which he refers is Wolf Lake. There was a Métis settlement there that was disbanded in 1960. His family stayed behind, where Willie and his cousin, Morris Cardinal, learned on the land. My dad would take Morris to the bush. This is how we became a good hunters. And that knowledge gets passed down. And Jake was a small man when his dad started taking him out to hunt. He was six, seven years old, I think. And Mikey was small, Gino was tiny. And Mama Ruby too. Ruby Smith said her son and her brother were inseparable. Those two were tied at the hips. And then, then when Michael came along, there's a, we called them the three, the, the trio. Morris, right from the time Jake was born, and my dad, they used to pick him up. And Jake was just a toddler even. They'd take him hunting. Jacob looked up at, to Morris, not just like a, an uncle, or, you know, it was just more than that. He was almost like that father figure. Even for myself, he was like a father figure to me too. And Morris learned from his father. My dad was a, a, a trapper, so that was something that was handed down to my son and my brother Morris, and they are the legacy of my, my late dad, who taught them, you know, how to live off the land, and that's what Morris and Jacob did, and uh, he taught them very well. They provided for a lot of families, not just my family, but he, they provided for the elders, they provided for aunts, uncles, siblings, anyone that couldn't go out to, to hunt. Jake and Morris didn't just know about living on the land. Jake was also supposed to become a pipe holder. My Uncle Willie was teaching him the teachings. Jake's wife says his beliefs and traditions formed a big part of his values. Uh, smudging was very important. Spirituality was just huge for him. He was, um, he was just a spiritual, loving person. He, he believed in God. He believed in Creator. Um, we we did go to the there's um, the Alliance Church in Lethbridge for a while, and they, we did go to one up north in Bonneville for a while too. Um, so Jake, Jake just he was spiritual. Jake was only months away from being honored. I teach him for eight years. He was supposed to get his sacred pipe. His family is supposed to come, and he was supposed to get his sacred pipe, be able to, to conduct his own sweats, make his own sweats and pick up his own herbs and heal. And Willie says that alone is enough reason for him to believe Jake didn't seek a confrontation, but would stand confident. So those people stop him and said something. Amores wasn't the guy He's going to back down. And so is Jacob. You don't bother them, you can't find any better people. But Jake, you'll try to talk out of it. Jake also talked people up. Sarah showed us some of Jake's motivational videos. 
He even has a Facebook page called The Motivational Predator. Hey everybody, Sunday afternoon here with the Motivational Predator and his family. We're out for a nice hike out in the mountains. I suggest you guys do the same. Time to start spending time with your family. Tell everybody you love them. Peace. Jacob Sampson wasn't just a traditionalist and a motivationalist. He was also a trained fighter. He did jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So that is when he met Tanner. We met Tanner the Bulldozer Bozer, where he currently trains in Sherwood Park, Alberta. Bozer has been in the UFC for three years and fighting professionally for almost 10 years altogether. Yeah, Jake Sampson um, ended up coaching me and my brother and a group of other people in Bonneville uh, in jiu-jitsu. He started teaching us and we made it a regular thing and the next thing you knew he had a whole club there and uh, classes for kids and adults and everything. Jake coached Bozer in 2013. Jake was instrumental in me winning my second fight. I won by rear naked choke, so I won by submission, something me and Jake had drilled a lot. Uh, he was in my corner for that fight. Bozer says Jake didn't just coach him. Jake ended up coaching not just me and my brother, who were, you know, 20 and 18 or something like that, but uh, he had a whole kids class, a lot of kids that uh, looked up to him and he'd bring them to tournaments. Bozer had just finished training when he got a phone call from his mother with the news about Jacob and Morris. So she told me that he'd been uh, shot along with his uncle and uh, yeah, it took me a minute. I, I remember I, I left the gym and my brain was like trying to sort it out and then uh, like by the time I got to my truck in the parking lot I just started crying. Two months later, Bozer won his next fight. I um, fought a guy named Felipe Linz in uh, UFC uh, that June in um, Vegas. And I won by knockout, and it was a big win for me. He was the PFL world champion before he was signed to UFC, so he was, uh, at my time, uh, at the time, he was my biggest win. And yeah, after, I mean, I said I dedicate, I wanted to dedicate that win to Jake. And I do, and I did. As for what happened on the evening of March 27th, 2020. Whatever kind of messed up misunderstanding or whether it was malevolence could have been, whatever, whatever happened, why ever it happened, so it's a, it's a tragedy. Jake had a family and kids, you know, young kids and a wife. And it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, there's not, not a better word than tragedy. You know, I, I actually had people messaging me or commenting on Facebook on, on things and arguing with me that my husband was a gang leader, I heard. He was a drug addict. He was a, oh, there was, uh, I can't, there was so many different stories. He was, he was this, he was that. Some of the comments APTN Investigate collected supported violence or even death. Within this community, there is a lot of unconscious bias when it comes to this case, as well as straight up bias um, when we talk about Jake and Morris or what's happened. Uh, if you know on Facebook, uh, in the media, there are people that are saying that they deserved it, that they were stealing or that they were just drunk natives out there doing no good. Jake's sister, Gina Lavasser, feels they represent many 
of the attitudes she encountered growing up in Bonneville. On the streets of Bonneville, um, we got jumped a lot, so there was a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, racism in the town. This area, specifically this area, um, we've had so many run-ins with so many different types of people, but mostly racism. And it's all geared towards being dirty natives. We had a swastika painted on the side of our, our home at one point. Um, there's a lot of really ugly stories. Lavisser says she had to leave. I moved. I took my children out of this community. Uh, I felt like they would not be safe. Uh, my son was already being bullied and picked on, both of my children. It was already beginning to be a problem. When I go hunting a year ago alone, a truck come in behind my back, I didn't feel good. Just like somebody's pointing gun at me. I didn't feel comfortable with the white man. As we were at the scene, a vehicle approached us slowly and turned around while still at a distance. I just have the camera move on that. Uh, watch. Yep. There's a car behind you. I don't know. Did he just turn on his lights? I could have sworn I just saw his flashing lights flash. Yeah, he's going real slow. He just flashed them again. While in the village of Glendon, the local bylaw officer appeared to flash their lights at us, as we were the only people on the road. But he turned onto a side street at the last moment. Oh no, it's uh, it's the peace it's peace officer. It's the Bonneville peace officer. Ah. Yeah. I'm here in the village of Glendon, just a few miles south of where the tragedy happened. I reached out to the mayor, the former mayor, and the town council, but nobody responded to my requests for an interview. We also reached out to the Alberta Ministry of Indigenous Relations, but Minister Rick Wilson was unable to meet for an interview and did not offer us a statement. Jury selection and a trial for the accused is scheduled for May 9th, 2022. It may help with closure, but the healing will continue. There's a huge hole in our lives, and my sons, they are no longer, you know, just, they've lost so much. And then my nieces and my nephew, um, my brother's kids, the, we have so much healing to do moving forward. Um, it should never have happened. I don't know how anyone can take anybody's life. The bush used to be their safe place. So my, my kids are like, well, we can't feel safe where daddy should have been safe. They don't, they don't feel safe very often anywhere, really.